Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Holder, and I am the New Jersey State Manager for Security Title Guarantee Corporation of Baltimore. On behalf of myself and all of my colleagues from across the country, I would like to welcome you to today's exciting webinar. A few housekeeping items. Folks in the audience are on listen-only mode. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to type them into the question or chat sections accordingly. We will have time to answer any questions you may have at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar topic is Succeed in the New World of Hiring. Our guest presenter is Eric Byro, founding member, partner of Anderson Byro LLC. He co-founded one of the premier executive search firms in the country with the vision of building and leading a team of dedicated search professionals and support staff. Born and raised into an entrepreneurial family, mentoring the team comes naturally. Combining innovative team building strategies with a keen attention to detail, Eric pay, plays a pivotal role in their ability to offer individualized cutting edge solutions to fit each client. He is known around the office for his competitive edge and lead by example style. Eric has applied his recruiting background to building a national recruiting and staffing firm focused on title and settlement companies throughout the United States. A thought leader in the industry, Eric is a member of the American Land Title Association and serves on both the talent and education committees. Eric routinely uses his experiences for speaking engagements, whether at Alta events or title insurance underwriting seminars. Eric is a native of Cleveland, Ohio, and holds a BSBA in finance from John Carroll University. Without further ado, I'll be turning the microphone over to Eric now, and I will come back and see you at the end of the webinar. Amy, thank you for the introduction, and um, we've known each other a long time. I appreciate you reaching out to uh, to schedule this, and um, wanted to thank all the agents that are in attendance today. I wanted to thank Security Title Guarantee Corporation of Baltimore for uh, for hosting this event and uh, and webinar, and I think it's something that no doubt is is very important in our business today we're a business the title insurance business is a, is, is a group of, of folks that don't necessarily manufacture widgets um, hence we are a, a service platform and em employees and the the talent that surrounds what we do day to day is very important so as we look at an unemployment rate that has gone from three and a half percent to over um, I think it hit over 8% during the uh, the pandemic last year. And as it creeps back down, there is no doubt a, uh, a shortage of talent out there and um, an, an important discussion to have on how we succeed um, in identifying talent. So what, what I want to chat about today is just this is what I would call a recruiting kind of 101 overview. Lots of pointers, lots of, of kind of what you should be looking for, do's and don'ts in the process. And at the end of the day, I think the hope is from the webinar today, you can you can take away a better idea on how to identify what you're looking for, how to, how to find individuals in your marketplace, what resources are out there to identify talent whether it's talent you can you can find now or talent that that would be beneficial down the road um, you know or use this to help train employees internally to do this as well and um, you know the biggest piece of all of this is are, are the folks that we hire the teams that we build and the culture that we build um, you know inside of our organizations so let's run through an example um, let's say, you know, you rolled into the office this past week and your top branch manager, or your top salesperson, or your top escrow officer has come in and, and tendered a resignation. Um, we'll, we'll talk later about counter offers and, and why we try to try to fight off counter offers. They're there and, 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 you know, sometimes you have to, especially in this market, extend uh, a counter offer to somebody to try to keep them. But let's say somebody's come into the office and, and has gone ahead and resigned. The, and, and now you know you need to replace them. So so 
before you jump on the phone or before you start posting ads, this is a really good opportunity to kind of kind of sit down and look at that position and kind of kind of decide, okay, is this do I need to replace that person? Um, if I do need to replace that person, you know, how do I go about doing it? And is it, are there any things I, I can change in that role? We'll talk about duties or requirements um, in a position description a little bit. But when you go into um, a recruiting project, to try to ha just try to have a strategy, try to have a clearly defined strategy of, I'm going to go at this on my own. I'm going to use these resources and I'm going to have a target fill date of 30 days. Um, that target fill date is very important. It helps keep you focused, helps keep maybe your team focused. And, um, you know, deadlines, deadlines are what deadlines are meant for, right? Um, so have a defined strategy, whether you're doing the search whether you're outsourcing the search to job boards or, or you're using recruiters or using team members, have a strategy going into it, have a target fill date, and then try to hit that target fill date. When we take on a recruiting project here, um, we will connect with clients and we will get all sorts of information about them, you know, who they are, what they're looking for, we'll collect position descriptions. But inside of this, um, we do a bunch of homework before before starting a search. We call this homework market research. So we work internally with Luke Noble, our director of recruiting, or I'm, I'm sorry, our director of research. And Luke goes into the market and 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 kind of looks around and does some things that I think would be important for the for you guys to do as well. So he will identify who the competitors are in the marketplace. He will then dig into those competitors via LinkedIn um via their websites making calls if necessary and what he's trying to do is come up with a picture of does is there talent that exists in the marketplace at my competitors if not is there talent that exists outside of my competitors that i need to go and attract talent from whether that be real estate related industries mortgage industries um you know and if there is great if there's not you know, then we're really digging into some some training, you know, bringing folks in green outside of the industry. He he will also look into um, any kind of educational programs that exist. If there's resources out there for folks that could that could send us, um, you know, where we could get leads from. So on top of looking at kind of the overall marketplace, um, he's also looking at compensation and trying to determine if the compensation requirements given to us from our client makes sense or is the market saying something different and sometimes you just got to make some phone calls to figure that out so i think it's important you know before again before you start you know posting ads out there before you start making phone calls you know have a strategy in mind for how you want to find the person and, and fill the role do some homework ahead of time, some kind of market research homework. Let's make sure there's available talent. Let's make sure that the compensation ranges work. And if all of that checks out, um, I think you'll be a little bit of a, ahead of the game when you do start talking to people. If we go back um, to something I mentioned earlier about kind of when somebody resigns, you can kind of look back at that role and say, okay, is it, is it, do we need that? Do we need that person? Do we need to make any changes? I think now is a good time where you could go to your team members um, or your employees and, and get their feedback. Their, their input is, is key, um, not only culturally, right, to make sure that the person you're hiring is going to be a good fit, but, um, you know, you could utilize them to determine, okay, is, is that the right position? You can utilize them um, when putting feelers out in the marketplace. Um, you can really bring them in to the recruiting process. In turn, this is really going to help kind of continue to build your culture internally. So utilize the the group that you have and the and the team that you have, even if that even if they're going to be peers, to the person that you're hiring. And then we always recommend we'll talk about interview steps later and do's and don'ts. But we always encourage. Um, having potential hires meet with team members um, during the interview process, even if it's, uh, even if they're meeting with potential peers. And then 
Um, kind of lastly, before you start digging in on a project, um, draft a position description. We recommend having a position description for every role inside of your entity. Um, position descriptions are, are as basic or as complex as you want to make them. They could be one page. They could be five pages. We, we recommend one to two pages um, and not not over, um, not getting into too many details that, that are, are not important to a position description. But a basic um, position description would have maybe an outline of your company, um, the duties, responsibilities, and requirements of the role. Um, I would not necessarily put compensation ranges on the position description, but you could put some wording around um, health benefits that you may offer, retirement plans that you have access to, PTO programs, or vacation policies that you may have. I just, I wouldn't necessarily list a compensation range on the position description. We, um, um, Amy mentioned my connection into Alta. Um, Alta, if you're not a member of Alta, they have, um, it would be a good idea to join, but they have position descriptions. So we went through and we created sample position descriptions if needed. Um, if you're not a member of Alta um, and you're looking for some sample position descriptions, please please let us know because we can get them to you. And there's some good ones that are out there, but we, we definitely recommend having position descriptions for all the roles inside of your company. So once you've um, figured out what you're looking for and everyone kind of internally is signing off on it and you're ready to, to, to start digging out there, a good thing to do beyond market research is um, to identify everyone in your marketplace. So if you, if you are looking for a closer, we would recommend having an Excel spreadsheet. So we use we use what is called PC Recruiter. It's our applicant tracking system internally. And, and obviously the, the large part of title insurance does not have that. So what we recommend is our uh, agents keeping Excel sheets of folks that are in their marketplaces. Um, LinkedIn Recruiter can do this um, if you do a lot of recruiting in the industry. Um, but we would recommend having what I would call a long list and a short list of targets that are out in the marketplace. And this would be a list that you would try to update on a regular basis, whether it be monthly, um, you know, every two months, could be, could be every couple of weeks you go in there, but an Excel list that has, you know, who the person is, um, a, a link to a LinkedIn account if they have it, uh, any sort of cell phone information that you can find, email addresses that you may acquire over the years, and you have a long list of people that you always want to kind of look at when a position opens, and then you have a short list of, you know, these are going to be the five or six people that you're going to call right away um, when, when a position opens and, and you know what you're looking for. So create a target list. It'll help keep track of information a little better, um, help keep you focused, especially on that short list, and, uh, and try to update it as much as you can. Um, now, if you're doing the work yourself and your, or, or your team's doing it, there's a lot of different methods out there um, to attract talent. So there's, you know, there's the internal approach, there's an external approach. External would be um, ads and search firms and things of that nature, but let's kind of focus on the internal approach to start. So, so no doubt, um, picking up the telephone and calling somebody can, can be a powerful tool. Um, calling into offices, you know, it's kind of hit or miss on getting folks. Websites will offer some contact information on, uh, on potential candidates, um, may have cell numbers, may not. LinkedIn accounts, if you connect with folks, some do, some don't. We use a service, it's a website, it's called Spokeo, um, S-P-O-K-E-O. And I think it's 25 bucks a month or 25 bucks every other month. But you can actually go in, once you create your account, you can go in and plug in um, a name, you know, first name, last name, general area where you think they may reside. And 
it will it will come up with some interesting results on folks. I know when I plug in my information into the system, it has multiple email addresses that I've had over the years. It's had um, I've had two cell numbers. It, it lists four or five cell numbers, so you may have to dial through the cells to get to the right person. But it has been a really really good resource for us. Um, again, it's called Spokio. And it's a way where if we have names, we know where people may reside or may work, it's a really good source of information. And then it's just a matter of picking up the phone and trying to attract that talent. So, you know, that's our number one, no doubt, is, is the direct call. Now, indirect ways would be LinkedIn, would be emails. Um, we recommend everybody here having a LinkedIn account. Um, if they do, we would consider, or we would recommend having a what we what is called a premium account. So it's about 65 bucks a month. And what it does is it allows you to connect with more people that are inside of your network or, or folks that touch your network, second connections, third connections. So it'll show more people that are out there. Um, it also allows you to send more in-mails. So if you're not connected with somebody, someone that's a second connection or a third connection, it allows you, I think it gives you 30 in-mails a month. And if, and if, if people don't respond to your in-mails, it credit, credits those back. So we do, um, we've had a lot of success sending people LinkedIn messages over the years. Emails are not as effective as they used to be, um, but they are a way to reach out to people. Um, they are a way to um, to try to attract talent and to try to um, you know motivate somebody to uh, or at least get your you know get the word out there that you're looking. Um, they're just not as effective as they used to be. If we go back to the phone, I forgot to mention this. We've had a ton of success over the past year and a half of sending direct text messages to folks even if we don't know them, well, especially if we don't know them. Um, you know, if we know them, it's easy, you just pick up the phone, but if we don't know somebody, and let's say we're trying to attract a processor or an escrow officer, um, and we know that person is sitting in an office every day, and they may be in a, in a cube, and they may not be able to, to, to have a kind of out there conversation, that's where the text has really, really paid off with production-based folks. So. We would recommend, um, you know, either picking up the phone and making the call, or sending a text message. At, at the, you may be surprised at some of the some of the feedback that you do get out there. Um, if we look at other avenues, um, you know, ads, you know, what, what would I consider an external technique? Um, there are ways to get applicants through ads. Um, sometimes it's not the best applicants, but um, Indeed can be a good tool. Indeed can be a really good tool if you're looking to bring folks in from outside of Title. Um, Indeed costs us about a hundred bucks a month per user. We use it quite a bit in a, in our staffing firm that we have, and where we're looking to attract talent. And it has um, so many outreaches that you can make and and kind of resumes that you can see on a month to month basis. But if you are bringing you know, folks that you're willing to train into the industry. Um, Indeed's a good one. ZipRecruiter's a good one. Um, you know, LinkedIn um, has a job board that you can post your jobs to. Um, so there, there are ways, you know, externally that you can kind of get word out there through some ads. Again, sometimes they're effective, sometimes they're not effective. If we look at the the technology, or if we look at, I'm sorry, the social media component of recruiting day to day, what we like to see or what we see successful companies doing are having social media accounts and letting folks know not just who they are on social media, but kind of what makes them tick day to day. So, so what I mean by that, having LinkedIn, beyond a website, having LinkedIn, Facebook, maybe a Twitter account, maybe an Instagram account of your company, but of your really showing off who you are as a, in who, what your culture is 
day to day. If you use social media, and this is kind of long term recruiting strategy, but if you use and engage social media, we're now looking to hire the next generation of folks that are coming into our our industry. You know, let's let's face it, they're they're a lot younger than we are. Um, the group of millennials and, and the the um, the Gen Zs of the world are a, a more tech focused group. They're a social media focused group. We're seeing usage day to day grow via social media platforms, not so much via websites or company websites anymore. Um, so we think it's important to have social media accounts for your organizations to show off your company culture on those social media platforms. And then um, when you do have needs that come up, you can then post those positions to your social media accounts and um, try to gain, you know, gain candidates from that. Um, so it's something to think about um, if you don't have those accounts. And then um, when you're finally reaching out to folks, it's, you know, our, what we do, it's very simple. You just make an introduction. You say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Are you interested in sitting down and a cup of coffee? Are you interested in having a call? Um, what we do day to day and what we recommend doing day to day when chatting with candidates is beyond figuring out their skill set, is really testing their motivations. And you do that from, from them making the first appointment. You do that by requesting a resume of a candidate. And if they do what you need them to do step by step, um, then you'll have a really good idea of, okay, this, this person appears to be motivated. If you get somebody on the phone and they say, well, I'm, I'm always interested in exploring opportunities and they want to jump right into the money conversation, um, they may not be as motivated as, as you would want them to be. So um, don't be afraid to test candidates' motivations, you know, set an appointment, collect resumes. Um, if you see a resume that's not updated, have them update a resume, um, checking references, having them send reference lists, things of that nature. It's important to do that and, and kind of do that as, as early as you can in the process. So once we do have folks that are interested, um, you know, you, you think they're motivated, you know, and, and you're into the, now what we consider obviously the interview process, there are two main objectives that you have. And these are, these are pretty straightforward, right? The person you're interviewing, do they, do they fit the role? And do they fit your company culture? Um, we'll talk more about culture, that being more important, but um, let's talk about credentials. So you've created this beautiful position description. Uh, don't be afraid to go down bullet point by bullet point with candidates to figure out if they meet, you know, meet the requirements of the position. Um, we are having more and more or we're seeing more and more companies out there creating tests or test files for experienced folks in the industry and giving experienced folks, you know, kind of that assessment or that test to take. Um, and we're seeing a lot of success from that. So if you, if you don't have anything like that, if you don't have any assessments that you've created, um, maybe think about that, give that some thought. And again, we're, you know, we're in this weird area where talent is very, very hard to come by. But if we're hiring experienced folks, obviously we want to make sure that they have the right talent base. So don't be afraid to, to, to create some assessments, to give candidates those assessments and, and to see how they do on them. And um, we have an agent in New York where, you know, two out of four, two, two out of two out of two out of five times, um, it will, it can, it can weed some people out. So, and it, and it can, can save some headaches that might come, might come down the road. Um, so verifying candidates credentials is very important. Um, again, more important is a cultural fit. So how do we do that? So you do that a couple different ways. We, we project culture during an interview and you want to see kind of culture that, that comes back to you and if folks can fit into that culture. So this is where you can really engage your team, um, you know, to figure out, okay, is, you know, in the interview process, 
have your team interview that person, see if there's a cultural fit there. You can look at prior organizations that that person has worked at. You know, are those groups similar to your company? Um, if they are and that person washed out, okay, that might tell you something. If it's a different culture and they were there for 15 years, well, it might not be a direct fit, um, you know, for, for what you've built, you know, and the culture that, you, that you've sustained for so many years. So, you know, we recommend trying to figure out pretty early in the process, does, is somebody going to fit the culture? Now, there are resources out there. Um, we use this profile. Um, there's a workplace assessment that, it, that a candidate can take. So what we do, especially when we're working on senior level searches, and we did this internally, we, uh, my business partner and I, we took this profiles pretty early in our career. We tried to figure out what were we good at what weren't we good at? So a, a this profile will tell you, you know, is the person an, an introvert? Are they an extrovert? Um, you know, are they results oriented? Are they a more emotionally driven to make decisions? Um, you know, if they're an introvert, kind of what makes them tick day to day? So if you have kind of cultural assessments that you can take, understand who you are, as a leader, understand what your team kind of makeup is day to day. And then in the process, kind of give that to folks, give that to, to, to candidates that are out there. Um, that could help weed out some people as well, or really figure out if somebody's going to be a fit. So, and you don't have to use them. You don't have to use this profile. There are other, there, there are PI indexes that are out there um, that can help you along the way, but there are a number of resources that, that you can utilize to figure out, okay, is this, is this person going to fit or not? Um, during that interview process, there are some more tips kind of to offer. There is a time to talk about money and there is a time to not talk about money. If you or the candidate jumps into conversation to jumps into to compensation too early, sometimes that kind of that can remain the focus or that will be the focus then moving forward it'll be the most important thing you know kind of kind of in the room at that time and it is very important there's no no doubt about it so what we recommend is on the first couple of calls on the the first kind of lengthy interview not talking about money we could talk about benefits you can talk about health um, dental, vision, 401ks, IRAs that you may have, um, you know, any sort of retirement plan, any sort of vacation policy, sick policy that you may have. It is important to get that stuff out early, especially on the medical benefits portion. I've seen, I'm sure you have, you, you, there are lots of plans out there. They, they cost all sorts of ranges, from zero dollars to thousands of dollars per month. So it is important to get that stuff out there pretty early in the process. But as far as compensation goes, um, we recommend leaving that until after you have solved these two objectives. If the person has the credentials that you need, if the person fits your culture, then we feel it's appropriate to then start diving into, okay, well, we know those two things work. Now can we make the money work? Now, there are 19 states where you're not supposed to ask about compensation. And there are 19 that are that are pretty easy if you just type in what states can I can I ask comp and, and not comp. The, there are technically 19 states out there where they don't want you going to a candidate or prospective employee and saying, hey, how much were you making at your firm? I'll do better, right? What they more want you asking is, okay, what, what is your compensation range that you're looking for? Or you can then give them your range. If if you ask somebody, hey, what, what range are you looking for? Odds are pretty good. They're going to tell you where they're at. And that's fine. If they tell you where they're at and you didn't ask them, then, um, you know, then, then have at it. But once you've, once you've solved the two objectives, then it's start, you know, then dive into, then dive into compensation. 
that now becomes the most important thing. That's kind of the last thing in, in, in structuring a deal and, uh, and, and dive in once you've figured out you know, the two things prior to. And then just one last tip on, on interviewing folks. Um, be clear after every step, whether they're a fit or not a fit. Give them an idea of what the next step is in the process. Um, if they're not a fit, don't be afraid to tell them that. If they are a fit, um, set clearly defined expectations, um, clearly defined goals on, on when things are going to happen. If you do that, it'll, you know, it just kind of speeds up the process along the way. It takes all that, takes all that gray area right out of it. So let's say you have identified um, the person that you want to bring aboard, and now we've you know, we're kind of in the offer process and, and trying to hammer out a deal. We talked about the benefits summary. We talked about trying to do that early in the process. If you have created a benefits outline or a benefits summary of the offering, um, awesome. You know, have that, share that early in the process. If you haven't created that, we would recommend um, that you create a one pager or a two pager that outlines um, what you have or maybe what you don't have. You, you don't necessarily need to put your costs on there, um, your, you know, your exact medical costs, but um, it is a nice, um, a nice to have out there for prospective candidates to have a benefit summary for them to take a look at. Um, it's also something to share with them. Um, so it creates more dialogue, which is good. When you're, um, you know, again, when you're ready to make an offer, make sure that any question that 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 needed to be asked is is kind of asked at this point, especially if it relates to the job, um, if it relates to culture, if it re relates, you know, to office location, which is, um, you know, I guess in, in some areas becoming less important day to day. We're seeing a lot, obviously a lot of remote based workforces, but try to try to get all those get all those questions answered um, now. Um, references are very important. We check references with every single hire. Now there are different times you can do it. Um, if you do it during the offer process or before the offer process, that will um, I mean, you'll have a really good idea from from their resume, from the interview process, um, you know, from going through the position description, whether they fit um, or not. It just depends where you want to where you want to check the references. Sometimes we check them early in the process to give us a better justification if the person is going to fit the job or not, if they're going to fit the culture. Sometimes we wait until a candidate has uh, verbally accepted or signed on the dotted line. And the reason we will sometimes wait is because it is such a small industry and, and title is not that small, it's a $21 billion industry, but we are so well connected and people are so well, you know, pe the, the industry itself, you know, everyone knows each other, which is great. So, you know, one thing we've seen over the years is if you start checking references too soon, word starts to spread on the street that that person's looking or that you're looking or you're trying to take people. So sometimes we will wait until they have signed on the dotted line. And then sometimes we're going to talk about counter offers, but sometimes we will wait until that person has given notice before checking some of their references. So we always recommend collecting three to four business references and collecting one or two personal references in the process. Um, we use a sample, and I can share this, but we have a reference interview format. It's it's 21 questions, but it gets into all sorts of stuff on um, how that person works with other people in the office. You know, are they are they a team player? Are they a lone ranger? Um, what were they successful in the day? Were they not successful? Um, again, it's, it's pretty in depth. It, it goes into a lot about that person. Um, but if you collect, you know, three to four business references, one or two personal references, and if you save some of those references 
for after that person has resigned that you start checking those references that the references then call your 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 hire your potential hire back start congratulating them that can help drag somebody through you know what what I what we will consider the dreaded counter offer conversation help keeps them kind of motivated moving forward especially when they're receiving phone calls so reference checks are important um we recommend absolutely doing them um you just got to try to figure out where does it make sense early in the process during the offer process maybe some after um but they're important to do nonetheless and then we deal with a lot of counter offers um we deal with a lot of candidates that um unfortunately not a lot but candidates that that want to kind of take that offer you know and, and and shop it so what we recommend this is the kind of the last bullet point here is when you're delivering an offer deliver it verbally um whether it's in person or over the phone and get them to verbally accept that offer now you can go back and forth you can negotiate back and forth but we find um, our success rate drastically increases when you can get somebody to say, I accept your offer and shake hands. If you can do it in person, even better. Um, and then say, okay, now that we have agreed to the deal, the last thing we're gonna do is put it in writing. And that should be pretty straightforward. Now, if, if you have some restrictive language in the agreement that may create some more follow-up questions, but if it's just a kind of a straight out offer letter, then there's really not a whole lot else to discuss. And it helps, you know, once you get that verbal acceptance, it really helps keep that, keep that person focused and, and you've taken their word. So it helps no doubt um, fight off counter offers. So if they do accept and they do sign on, sign on the dotted line, Odds are, especially if they're experienced, and, and if they're working and they're not experienced, we still may be facing this. Um, we're here. I mean, counter offers are a part of what we deal with day to day. Um, I understand it's hard losing good people, and there are times when you try to keep folks, and, and that's okay. But um, and what we're talking about here, we're, we're, we need to try to try to fight those off as much as as much as possible. So. During the interview process, when you're chatting with candidates, um, you can kind of prep them or start to prep them. And we always ask, we ask every candidate that we interview, uh, if you were gonna go in and resign, um, what would your supervisor say or what would the owner of the company say and how would they respond? And you can start to get an idea of, okay, this is what I'm gonna be up against. If, if the candidate says, hey, my boss is gonna, you know, pull me aside and, you know, give me extra money right off the bat, um, you know, maybe that, maybe knowing that might not lead you down the path of, of, of dealing with that, that candidate, especially if they say things like, yes, I would, I would look at a counter offer. Um, if the candidate says, you know, hey, my, you know, they're gonna, I know they're gonna parade me for two weeks. Well, I mean, that, that gives you extra selling points on, on why that person shouldn't be working there and why they should come work for you. So if you can kind of start to prep candidates a little bit, um, you know, there's there are lots of facts out there on counter offers. Um, some are facts, some some are not, you know, not necessarily not facts, but um, just things to, to tell folks. But um, what we have seen um in the industry in the title industry and these these are actually hard facts are if you accept a counter offer and we tell people this if you accept a counter offer 40 percent of the time you're going to be gone within six months now it doesn't mean necessarily that your company is going to let you go but um they may um because you've you've put yourself out there that that you are looking for another position or they're out there talking to folks so they may let you go um you know you you've resigned they might start looking for your replacement um you know an, another thing that kind of ticks up those percentages is the person wants to leave anyways so they might accept a counter offer but then realize well i took some more money but it didn't solve 
you know, it didn't solve my pain day to day, you know, that I was, you know, that I've been feeling for a couple of years now or, or however long. So um, there are some, you know, kind of things that you can, you can do um, or, or, or things that you can tell them that can help fight off counter offers. And we have a list of 15 things that we can pull out at any one point to say, hey, this is, this is not the best thing for you. Do not accept a counter offer because it's not going to change your feeling day to day of the entity that you're working with. It's not going to change you accepting a counter offer is not going to change, um, you know, the way your employer deals with you day to day. It's not going to change, you know, the, the, the company culture day to day. It's not going to change the path that that company is on. And you may be on a different path. So you can work, work with candidates um, that way to try to fight off counter offers. We've talked about some of the traps and, and, you know, how to avoid them. So early in the process, asking them how their boss would respond, asking candidates if they would consider a counter offer. When you're going through a candidate's resume and you're asking them, okay, well, I, you know, I see you left in 2015. You know, can you tell me about that process? You know, oh, they, you know, they offered me a counter and I, I declined it because, you know, I would never accept one. You know, you, th that tells you something about the person that you're, that you're, that you're dealing with. So you got to kind of look out for, um, you know, how's this person going to respond? And I think it's just easy as asking them how they're going to respond. And then, you know, unfortunately, there are times when we just need to, we need to walk away, walk away from deals. Uh, we give candidates 24 hours to sign on the dotted line once they receive the offer letter. Now, we've gotten a verbal acceptance. Um, we've sent the offer. We've acknowledged that the language in the offer letter looks okay. So if you check those boxes, then it's 24 hours. Uh, if if it's been three days or four days and you still don't have a signed offer letter, um, you, you know that's 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 not a good sign, obviously. So there, you know, time kills all deals, and it's just a matter of how comfortable you are. Um, you know, when you know a deal is dead, um, getting getting out of that deal or pulling away from it, and that's just kind of uh, you know. A, whatever you're personally comfortable with, but just keep an eye out, uh, especially on, on that signed offer letter. If it's not coming in the time that you need it to come, um, you, you could be running up against a, against a counter offer, um, which is unfortunate, unfortunate, but again, we, we deal with these, um, you know, the industry is just dealing with this day to day at this point. So let's say, um, the person has signed the offer letter, they've resigned, they've openly acknowledged that, you know, they've, they've given two weeks notice, their boss has accepted the two weeks notice. A lot, a lot, and I mean a lot can be done um, to keep your new hire engaged. And a lot can be done ahead of time to really um, help onboard that person. So now this kind of gets away from recruiting and and more into okay how do i get them how do i get them in the process you know kind of as quick as as quick as possible or, or up and running as quick as possible there may also be some things out there after they've signed an offer letter um that you need to figure that, that you need to complete or you need to figure out so um if we look at background checks and remaining reference checks well, let's let's stick on the background check um we recommend doing this before a person gives recognition, re resignation, sometimes sometimes that's met, sometimes that's not. Um, but if we focus on background checks, at the very least, criminal checks, low off at the federal level, at the state level, and then and then where whatever county they've lived in, so they'll do those checks. And there are obviously a lot of services out there. If the person has access to escrow accounts, obviously we, we don't recommend that. Um, but let's say they would in the first two years get access to escrow accounts. We always recommend checking their credit. Um, 
it helps our insurance guys sleep at night when we do it. So if, if our clients don't do it, we will do it for them. But we would recommend checking their credit and looking for uh, any sort of poor history that is out there, looking for any sort of judgments that may be out there that could be work-related or non-work-related. But it could help it could help paint that picture a little better on, uh, okay, who is this person? Um, you know, should they have this authority down the road? Um, you know, if, if you have that out there. So things to think about, no doubt, with criminal and credit checks, um, re check remaining references, um, you know, before that person starts, new hire paperwork, um, getting the new W-4 forms filled out, having them uh, go through the I-9 and E-Verify system, um, getting benefits paperwork filled out before they, you know, step foot in your door. Um, again, things that can be done to kind of speed up their onboarding into your organization. And then lastly, uh, there are, you know, tons of training platforms that are out there. Um, can you, you know, you got to ask yourself, are there systems that you have internally that that person, you know, if they don't have experience on, is there a way for them to, to get trained on before they start with you? Um, will help bring them up to speed a little quicker. Do you have training manuals? Um, if there's any software related systems, if there are processes that you have internally, if you don't have training manuals, you know, we would recommend looking at your vendors to see what they have created um, or, you know, creating training manuals yourself to give the folks that, um, you know, that are either starting with you or that have started with you and you're, you know, you're trying to get them trained up as quick as possible. So, you know, if we kind of look back, you know, at this, at this whole process, you know, we think it's important to have an, have a strategy that is outlined, um, have your position descriptions um, created, keep an Excel sheet of folks that are in your market think folks that you especially the folks that you think are really talented that you may not hire today but you may hire down the road um, you know reaching out to folks through various methods using and using employees to help spread the word um, you know reaching out to folks directly on their cell phone through you know through calls through text messages and then just digging in you know trying to figure out, okay, is that person who they say they are? Do they fit what I'm looking for? And do they fit our culture? Um, you know, we've talked a lot about employees, current employees helping out in the process, using them to figure out, you know, if they, if they, um, you know, if that new hire is going to fit the team and, and do that because team is, um, team is very important. Um, I always like to end these with a with a quote. That's a good kind of teamwork related one. Um, great things in business are never done by one person; they are done by a team of people. Um, said by the the, the great late um, Steve Jobs. But um, culture, you know, we can be the best at examining title. We can be the best at 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 closings. Um, but what helps make us the best is the culture that we've that we've built over the years, right? And that that our various groups have built over the years. So utilize your team whenever possible um, in this process, and it, it's you know it'll help make you more successful, no doubt. Amy, I I didn't I didn't I didn't do a lot of breathing there, so hopefully <laughs> hopefully. I got, I do have a quick question on the um, on the team aspect of it. So, do you have any creative thoughts or ideas on how to engage a team to either? I mean, obviously, we mentioned that the title insurance industry is such a small industry; everybody knows one another. So, what are some ideas on how to engage or or incentivize? I guess I'm I'm looking for um employees to reach out to the people they may know to fill positions so the, okay so there's two ways there's well, let's talk about engagement and let's talk about in incentive so engagement uh, if you have local associations 
whether they're title related or not related. Um, we recommend not only you getting involved in one or two, but then having your employees getting involved in various local land title associations or state land title associations. So you, so they can kind of build their Rolodex of people that, that they will meet and get to know and network with. Right. So that could really help when recruiting folks, it just creates a bigger network for you, for them, for the organization. So associations um, are, are a huge component. And then, in, you know, I mean, money talks, right? Um, you know, we have um, recommended and we also have internally, um, you know, I don't want to call them rewards, but, you know, essentially they're, they're $500 rewards. They are what they are, where we will incentivize folks incentivize folks to help bring people into the organization when a need arises. So there, there, and there's a lot more to do or could be done beyond that, but those getting people in, involved in associations or, um, you know, having some sort of reward system can go a long way. Gotcha. Anshi, do we have any questions or comments from the attendees? Hi, Amy. I'm, I'm taking a look in the question sections. I don't see anything, but I will be sure to shout them out if we get any uh, feedback or questions in the next uh, 10 minutes. Okay, because I do have a couple of more. So I'm going, I'll continue to ask my questions, and then I would encourage any of the attendees, if you have questions, um, to put them into the question box, and then on she can um, funnel them out to Eric. But Eric, I wanted to ask you about, you, you talked a little bit about social media. As an employer, um, should I uh, place any weight on um, a candidate's social media presence and the uh, information that they may be posting out on social media? Off the record. <laughs> um, yes. Um, on the record, there there are some some kind of not rules, but there are kind of some do's and don'ts where where states are are making sure that hiring authorities don't use social media accounts and, and dig in on social media accounts. Um, but, but let's, let's be honest. We do, you know, we look, we look into, you know, we want to, when we're interviewing candidates, we want to know all the nitty gritty, right. And that can come out, you know, in the interview process, chatting with people, it can also come out when going on Facebook pages or Twitter pages and seeing if that, potential hire, um, you know, as community minded or if they're, um, you know, on a different path that doesn't make sense for the culture of the company. So we, we do, we do use them from time to time. You, you got to be careful you, because number one, you really want to make sure that that is the person you're, you're, you know, you're interviewing. Now, Facebook's easy, right? You, you, know, sure. you meet the person, you see, you see the person on Facebook. The problem becomes in some with some of the Instagram accounts, some of the Twitter accounts, where you may think you're looking at your candidate, but it could be somebody completely different. Right. So we use them. We would just caution folks to 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 make sure they really are really digging in on that person and not somebody else. And then another question I had is when you do find a candidate, how many interviews um, should you be conducting with that candidate? Is it an, like an initial and then a follow-up or an initial and then a staff introduction, then a follow-up? Yeah, it, if, it's a, if it's what we would consider kind of a production level role. So, um, you know, search exam, um, you know, that title side or the escrow side, you know, the closer processor side of the business, you know, at least, at least two interviews. OK, so kind of an, an initial screen that can be done over the phone um, and then, a, you know, a follow up meeting, whether it be done via Zoom or, you know, the face to face interviews are coming back. But I would say at least two. One, one's not going to get it. One's not going to cover it, I don't think, for any role out there. Um, a lot of times for, for really good closers, it could be three or four meetings, you know, where then after the first face-to-face -face meeting, you may do a lunch meeting or you may bring somebody by the office to meet the team. Okay. If it if it's a senior level role, it's, you know, now you're, I mean, you could be looking at, you know, four, five, six, seven meetings. Sure. 
to sure. really hire a, a C level person or you know director of sales or IT director. So, right. I would say no less than two. Okay, thank you for that one. And then um, my last question is, um, could you recommend when look when talking to references? I mean, I, I think it's I heard what you said about a, a twenty one point questionnaire. I think it was. Um, but could it, are there two or three questions that you could ask when speaking to a reference that is going to give you um, enough information about a candidate? And what are the top three questions? I guess that's my question. So if I kind of pull this up here, I don't know if you can see this or if this kind of popped up on the screen. But this is kind of the format that we go through. Um, you know, when when I think that I think the the best questions at the end. Um, you know, when when we ask, okay, what can we expect of this person, right? And that you know, you've kind of kind of pulled them through seventeen questions at that point. And I think then they're just going to get out with, okay, this is, I mean, this is what you're getting. Right. So, so, th you know, that that's important. I think, I think teamwork is, is really important. Right. So, you know, is this person a team player? Or are they a lone ranger? You know, what, what kind of makes them, them tick day to day? Um, more often than not, the references, especially the personal references are, are going to be pretty positive. Right. So hobbies are an important question we're trying to figure out what what kind of makes that person tick day to day inside or outside of work i'm saying so that that is definitely an important question and then um number four here i think is is good um you know what do they do less well and if they say well i don't you know they're great at everything say okay well i i got that they're really good at um at resware but are there any systems that are not good at? Is there any step in the process that, that that they could use improvement on? And that might, you know, that might kind of help you help you along the way. Awesome, awesome. Anshi, do we have any other questions? Uh, no questions. Um, I had one that I was coming up, just been uh, hearing you guys discuss. Um, I have had the pleasure of, in my career, taking multiple assessment. Um, assessments for uh, for uh, as a as a candidate for hire. Uh, one of them was the DISC personality profiles assessment, um, and also the Wonderlic that's used in um, I believe the NFL as well. Um, do you, Eric, have any um, preferred or recommended assessments, uh, tests, or testing that you like? Yeah, I'd like to use. We use the DISC profile. Yeah, so we we're not psychologists here. We, but it spits out <laughs> it feels like we are sometimes <laughs> um, but it it spits out a lot of it's 20 pages for their workplace um assessment which we really like there's a lot of data there um you know but it, it can it's really good it'll tell somebody okay are they are they results oriented and it'll it'll come up if it is and that would be in the in the d category and then you know or are they more of a di type of person. So it's it's cost effective. It's about $65 a test. And some of the assessments can, can cost a lot more than that. And, and some of those assessments you need to be trained on um, to really read them. So we really like the this profile because you don't necessarily need to be trained on it. It it spits out a really good lengthy report and it tells you how that person it really helps tell you who that person is, kind of what makes them tick day to day, and then how they would interact with with different, you know, folks that come up on the other side of the coin. So if somebody is a strong DI, and it's going to tell them, okay, how would they respond to somebody that's a that's an S or a or a full blown C? And if you give that to, if you take it or you give it to your team members, then you'll kind of know, okay, this is this is where people are, and this is how then this potential candidate would interact with myself or my team. Very good. Great. Thank you. 
All right. Well, I um, I think that's our time for today. So I would like to thank everybody that has attended. Um, I believe that this uh, webinar uh, will be up on the website, Anshi, correct? Yes, it will be. Okay. So uh, uh, starting tomorrow, if anybody wanted to go back and reference anything that was discussed, you would find it there. Um, and I would encourage anyone that that is on the webinar that has any uh, follow-up uh, questions to get in touch with your um, agency representative and um, and they'll be able to provide you with whatever information you might need. Thank you again and uh, as always thank you for supporting security title. Eric you did a great job. Thank you very much and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Take care. Thanks.